Hello. Hello, RubyConf. Um, hey. I hope you all had a great lunch. Um, welcome to my talk. And I would like to start my talk with a little story. And it's about my first job in, like, my, it was actually my last job, and it was the first job that I had after university. And I was one of the first engineers in the team. Um, there was only my boss and another engineer, and then I joined. And over time, we started to grow this team, and we hired more and more developers. Um, so in the end, we had around 12 developers. And so over this time, I was helping onboarding all these new engineers. I did pair programming and mob programming. And I, I was taking more and more responsibilities. And at some point, I got promoted to be a senior developer. And it was, still one of my it was still my first job, and I was like at a point in my career where I was sitting down and thinking and reflecting, what is a senior developer? What is actually a senior developer? So I was sitting down, thinking about it. And so one thing that came to my mind is experience. So probably most of you would agree, somebody who was like, was a software engineer for 10 years, 15 years, who has a lot of experience, is maybe a senior developer. Or somebody who provides leadership, who can help uh, bring a feature from inception to production and split it up and delegate uh, different work tasks to different developers. Or may maybe somebody who is a good mentor who can help junior developers to level up to become better de developers. And one thing, or one thing what also came to my mind is somebody who is a really good programmer like, master's programming is, like, is a little bit strong, but somebody who is a really good programmer. And I was a Ruby programmer, so for me it was somebody who was really good in programming Ruby. So I was sitting down and thinking, like, how can I become a better Ruby programmer? And it came to my mind, Ruby is just a computer program. So, and as you can study a race application to understand it better, you could just study Ruby to become a better Ruby programmer. And that is the topic of my talk today, is digesting MRI by studying alternative Ruby implementations. Um, my name is Christian Brookmeyer. Um, most of what I talk today is on my website, brookmeyer.net, so I wrote a few blog articles. Um, most stuff about JRuby, about the performance um, work I did there. So if you're interested, if you want to learn more, and also see more benchmarks, then go to my blog. I live at the moment in Bristol in the United Kingdom. Bristol is around two hours away from London, so it's not London, and there are more cities in England except London. Um, I currently work at Cookpad, so the global headquarter of Cookpad is also in Bristol. Um, if you're into home cooking, definitely check out Cookpad. If you're interested in cooking, then talk to me after the after the talk. And today, I brought three different examples to you. So one example is about MRI. Um, my second example is about Rubinius and Opal. And the last example is about JRuby. So the first two examples are quite small. And then um, most stuff I will talk about JRuby. So let's get started. So my first example is about uh, MRI, CRuby. So if most, pe most people, when they speak about Ruby, they mean actually MRI, which is the reference implementation of Ruby, started by Mats in 1993. It's implemented in C, and as I said, like, it's most people, when they mean Ruby, they mean MRI. So to recap, I wanted to become a better Ruby programmer. I thought, Ruby is a computer program, so I will just go to, uh, to GitHub, um, read the Ruby source code, um, go to the Ruby issue tracker, maybe fix a bug, implement a feature, and eventually I will be a better Ruby programmer. So my first step was I went to the Ruby issue tracker, browse around, search for features or bugs I could work on, and I found this issue. Array min max it's, is much slower than calling both min and max. So what does it mean? So you have an array with the numbers 1 to 10, 1 to 9, 
And then you can call array.minmax and it will return an array with the numbers one and nine. Or you can call array.min and array.max and it will return the same result. So I did a benchmark, uh, compared the two methods, and it turns out array min max is actually 1.8 uh, times slower than calling array min and array dot, uh, max. And that was surprisingly because I was, was expecting calling one method should be faster than calling two methods. So and the reason is array min max uh, is included by the enumerable uh, module and doesn't use the internal fast methods of array. So I thought, ah, sounds, sounds like a good first issue. So I started, I forked Ruby, started programming, created a pull request, and yeah, I was happy. <laughs> but my pull request got closed really quick because there was already a patch attached to the Ruby issue tracker, which I didn't see. And I was really disappointed because I thought like, I did all this work and I was hoping to get a patch into Ruby and then I was thinking back, my goal was understanding Ruby better. So my goal wasn't getting a patch into Ruby. And actually, I, I learned something new. I learned how to compile Ruby. I learned to program a little bit in C, which I didn't do since university. Um, it challenged me to try, try out something new. And eventually, it also inspired me to look into different implementations of Ruby. Which brings us to my second example, which is about Rubinius and Opal. So Rubinius is a Ruby implementation written in Ruby. So only the virtual machine is implemented in C and C++. And Opal is actually a Ruby to JavaScript transpiler, which makes it possible to run your Ruby code in the browser, so it's really cool. And my idea was, as MRI is a reference implementation of Ruby, I will go to the Ruby release notes, see what is new in Ruby, and then I will check out the different implementations and see if they already implemented these features, and if not, I will do it. So in Ruby 2.5, string got a method called delete prefix. And delete prefix does, you have a string, and then you can call delete prefix, and it will just remove the first part of the string if it matches. So in Rubinius, it looks very similar, simple. So it does just a type conversion, and then if the string starts with this prefix, then it removes it. Otherwise, it will return a copy of the string. And in Opal, it actually looks very, very similar. So what you can see here is, or the one difference is, uh, the percentage x, which uh, usually shells out and executes on your shell. Um, what it does here is it, um, it executes JavaScript code. So I was starting implementing it, and my first steps was like I was playing around with this new method, and I tried, it should work with a symbol, right? So I was trying it out with a symbol, and I got a type error, and I was, I was a little bit surprised because I was expecting it works with a symbol. So I was looking at the implementation again, and it does a conversion to, with, to str. And as it turns out, um, a symbol does not implement the to str method because a symbol is not a string. It implements the to s method, but not the to str. And there's actually a really interesting issue on the Ruby issue tracker from six years ago um, about discussions if a symbol should implement the to str method. And they also discuss why it shouldn't, because a symbol is not a string. It just in some, in some places, it behaves like a string. So, and I learned about explicit and implicit conversion. So in the explicit case, we say, this symbol is a string, and then we use it as a string. And in the implicit case, Ruby does it in the, in the background for us. So for instance, here we can just cr create a class prefix, implement the to str method, and then use it as a prefix, and it would work. And interestingly, um, if you look into Rails, that is what they do in the path class. So path was initially inherited from string, 
and Aaron Patterson refactored it like seven years ago to be not inherited by string anymore, and he implemented the 2str method. So what you can see here, um, you can take a string and concatenate it with a plus um, if you implement the 2str method, which doesn't work if you only implement 2s. And there was this pull request from seven years ago, and Aaron explains it very good on the issue. And then I looked again in the implementation, and I was surprised. So if you don't remove the prefix, so if it doesn't match, it returns a copy of the string, which surprised me a little bit. And on Monday evening, I was out for dinner, and I met uh, Ryan, which is the... Um, who did a talk this morning about Artichok, which is a Rust implementation of Ruby. And I was talking with him, and I was saying, like, I think I found a bug in Artichok because you don't return a copy of the string. You return the same string. So this is actually the bug. And he was saying, ah, that's interesting. Why, why did you not fix it? Why did you not send a pull request? So yesterday evening, I did a pull request, and Ryan already merged it. Um, so it's fixed now in Artichok. And I was looking more into it, why it does um, return a, a copy of the string, and turns out most methods on string return a copy if they don't do anything, um, just to be consistent. For instance, I have a string hello, and I want to delete uh, the character A, which doesn't match in the string, and it returns a copy if you use chomp, which returns all the white space, so there's no white space in this string, it returns a copy of the string, or if you use gsub, um, which also replaces the, would replace the A with an A, um, which doesn't do anything in this case. It also returns a copy of the string. So what I learned with this contribution, it's, it, it was a really small contribution in three different projects, like actually only three or four lines of code, but I learned so many things about Ruby, and I digged into the Rails code, um, studied Rails, so it was really interesting. Which brings us to my last example, which is about JRuby. So JRuby is um, the Java implementation of Ruby, which runs on the JVM. And it's, um, it implements concurrency, and it's um, really fast. So actually, one of the like what is written on the documentation of JRuby on the GitHub page, one of the first sentences is, is um, it aims to be a complete, correct, and fast implementation of Ruby. So he thought, like, that sounds really interesting. So if one of the main goals is fast implementation, then it's probably fun to work on some performance issue. So I was, um, again, going to the Ruby issue track in the... JRuby issue tracker and looking around what I could do. And eventually I found this issue. Hash tables with open addressing. And that is a feature which got introduced in Ruby 2.4, which improved hash tables by around 40%. So made hash tables 40% faster. And I thought, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Um, how, how hard can it be? Like, just Two days ago, Aaron tweeted um, this tweet. So implement a hash, been there, done that. So seems <laughs> seems to be quite easy. Um, so I was looking into the issue, and I found the patch on MRI, which is like almost 1,500 lines of code. Um, and I'm not a C programmer. I didn't did never like I did some C in university, but I'm not a C programmer at all. Um, so I was like, okay, this is, this is probably not going to happen. I can't read like 1,500 lines of code in C and then transfer the knowledge to, uh, to JRuby. So my initial idea was, um, I already showed, or showed you in the first part of the talk, Rubinius. So my first idea was, I will look into Rubinius if they implemented it, I will just read the Ruby code there, and then I will implement it in JRuby. However, they didn't implement it. 
so my next idea was um, I already compiled Ruby, um, so I know how to compile it, and I thought like I will just put in, sprinkle in some puts, and then I will execute different code and try what it does to understand it better. So the rb underscore p method is just a print in C, and I thought like, okay, maybe maybe that would work. So I compiled compiled Ruby, tried it out, and got a segmentation fault. So that also didn't work. And so I was going back to the issue, and I was starting to read the patch and trying to understand it. And in the patch, there's actually at the top is a really good uh, description of the algorithm, what they implemented, uh, just written down with um, ASCII art, how it works. So I thought, like, let's, maybe I can try to implement this in Ruby try to understand what they did, and then transfer the knowledge to Java, and research a little bit how open addressing works. So that was my first, that was then my next step. So a hash, to, to recap, is we create a hash, and then we can set a key and with, a, with a value, and then we can retrieve the key again. So the approach, what they implemented before, was called separate chaining. And so in this case, we create a class hash, which has a um, buckets variable, uh, which is an array. And the, the array is a nested array. So what you see in the brackets means that the array, each value is by default an empty array. So if we want to set a key, we just find the key. If the key exists, we replace the value. If the key does not exist, we search for the bucket and append an uh, entry to it. And the entry is just a struct with a key and a value. So the find method um, finds the bucket and then just iterates over all entries in this array. So we have an array of nested arrays, basically. And the bucket, um, we find the bucket um, by calculating an index, and the index is the hash value of the key modulus uh, the bucket's length. So I was wondering why is this approach not good, or why, why do we want to implement a different approach? And the reason is called cache locality. So cache locality, this is copied from Wikipedia, is if a particular storage location is referenced, then it is likely that nearby memory locations will be referenced in the near future. So what does it mean? Imagine you have an array, and you iterate over the array to print out just what, what is in the array. Um, most cases, if you access the first value of the array, you also access the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth um, element. So that's a very common use case. So in cache locality, um, turns out like most modern computer architectures implement um, a feature if you access a value from the, from the um, memory, then it will load nearby memory into the CPU's cache, and then the next time you access it, it will already be in the cache. So in the case you access the first element, it will load the hopefully the whole array into the CPU's cache, and then accessing the second and the third element will be really fast. So that is basically what, you want to, um, what we want to do with open addressing, because with the approach, when you have nested arrays, it's unlikely that you have a, a cache hit. So in open addressing, first step, what we did is we were getting rid of the nested arrays. The first step is still the same. We find, uh, we check if the key already exists. If it exists, we replace the value. Uh, if it doesn't exist, we, uh, we find the bucket, and then we insert on the bucket the entry. So we don't append it anymore. We just insert it there. And find also just use, uh, the bucket um, from the buckets array. And the main difference now is uh, how we find the bucket. So we calculate the index again, and then we iterate over the one array, 
and try to find the key. And if we don't find the key, um, we calcul calculate the next index. And in our case, like simplify, simplified version for this talk is just we take the next um, step in the array. We take the next um, entry. So in, in, the real, in the real implementation, we have a second hash function, but here we just take the next uh, element. So I did this in Ruby, tried to understand it, and then I started to implement it in JRuby. Um, so I did started to refactor it internally. And there's this really famous quote from the programmi programmic pro programmer, which says, different languages solve the same problems in different ways. So I really, um, in the beginning, I found it really annoying in Java, the static typing, and then when it started to do a big refactoring, I really appreciated it because it guided me um, if you needed to replace a value, it told you that you forgot something, you need to go there. So doing the same refactoring in Ruby would be probably really hairy, really difficult. And you also need to wait until your tests pass or fail to, until you find some issues. And in software, we also have uh, this approach, release early, release often. So I started working on this issue, and really quick I realized um, I'm stuck. So what I did is I created like a draft pull request and asked uh, people from the JRuby community to help me. And what we heard on Monday in the keynote is ideas become bigger when you share them. So I think that was one of the, one of the reasons uh, I finished this project because I ask early for help and ask for input. Otherwise, I probably would have been stuck and yeah, probably wouldn't finish it. And so I finished the first implementation of this, of this new approach, but turns out it wasn't faster. So we were discussing in, in my pull request, in my draft pull request, why it's not faster, what we could try. And one approach uh, some contributor came up with was we should remove the entry object because then we remove a lot of object allocations. So what we did instead is we removed the entry object and then on the first position we entered the key and the second position, like plus one bucket, we entered the value and we removed a lot of object allocations. And that actually did, the, did improve the performance a lot. And a couple of weeks ago, I was at a Ruby conference and Akira Matsuda gave a talk about performance optimizations and he was saying this, performance optimization is a game in which you want to achieve a high score. So stuff like this, removing objects, you, you can't usually do in your daily, in your day to day job because if I co would come in tomorrow morning and start removing objects, then my coworkers probably would say, no, but in projects like this, uh, you, you can do it because you want to make the, the um, you want to make JRuby really fast, so you, you accept that you increase the complexity for, uh, for better performance. So I was finishing the pull request and then eventually we merged it, which took around two months. Um, I was working in the, in the evenings and on, on the weekends, the patch was in the whole patch was around 700 lines of code. And after it got merged, a couple of weeks later, we needed to revert it temporarily. Uh, so the issue is, turns out the new implementation performs is not as robust um, in concurrency as the previous uh, implementation was. So yeah, we are currently working on it to, to merge it soon back into it, but we need to make it more uh, solid and robust in concurrency cases, which for instance is not, not an issue in MRI because you have the global interpreter lock. So to recap this section, it's like what helped me really a lot was prototyping, so which I still use a lot in my day-to-day -day job. So if there's a feature which is too complex or which I'm not sure about, then I just do a really quick prototype, maybe 
outside even of, uh, of the project. And then also ask for help. So ask the community, um, make draft pull requests, share your ideas. So yeah, these were my three different examples. And I started my talk with a question like, what defines a senior developer? And I was like, I wanted to become a better Ruby programmer and master Ruby. I mean, probably nobody really masters Ruby, except maybe Mats. Um, but programmer, programming is, uh, you never stop learning. Like, every day you learn something new. And that's what, what you need to accept. And um, with open source, you can just like browse around on GitHub and learn how gems are implemented, how Ruby is implemented, and learn something new. And we also have a huge community, which is usually happy to help. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs>